Thank you very much. Can we have a round of applause for our panelists? You did. <laughs> oh, uh. um, thanks for being here. Uh, there's a whole long introduction that I'm supposed to read for all of you, but instead I'm going to ignore that and, and, and start with you know sort of like a personal introduction because you three might be you know some of the you know a little bit my like developer design heroes, all of you in, in different ways. Uh, Steve works at TL Draw as the founder and the and the and the, the creator of TL Draw, and he is one of the most uh, sort of insightful, detail-oriented developers I've ever seen when it comes to creating uh, incredible user interactions in TL Draw and elsewhere. Um, so glad to have you here, Steve. Thank you. Yes. And uh, Maggie is a uh, little bit of hybrid everything, uh, developer, a designer, anthropologist. Uh, she's an incredible deep thinker in the, in the paradigms of, uh, of, of u computer user uh, interaction, uh, computer human interaction, but also um, just a wonderful uh, designer and has contributed to so many, um, so many projects and, and so many uh, uh, resources on the internet, just, just JavaScript. So thanks for being here, Maggie. Uh, can we have a round of applause for Maggie? I get a round of applause? Oh. oh, did Steve not get a round of applause? Can oh. we have a round of applause for Steve as well? Uh, uh, and finally, Anjana joins us all the way from San Francisco. She is truly the polymath. She's you know, done a little bit of everything from uh, studying philosophy to teaching English to uh, computational linguistics. Um, and I think she brings all of these things together to a really holistic uh, view on programming. And she's working on some truly exciting projects, which I'm sure that we can hear during this panel. Thank you for being here, Anjana. All right, so, so let's get going. This, the, the topic of this panel is, um, is, is UX and developer uh, overlap. Mm. Um, and I think the one cliche question that we always hear is, uh, should designers code? And we don't really need to go into that here, but I want to pose the, the opposite question. Should every um, product engineer or, or front end engineer design? And what does it mean to participate in a design process? <laughs> Who wants to go first? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I mean, the simple answer is, is no, developers don't have to become designers, right? That's never the ask, or that's why we all resent the question, should designers code, should developers design? Everyone's like, well, I'm kind of drowning over here in, in JavaScript tooling. Please don't make me take on a whole new discipline. Um, I think it's maybe more interesting to turn it into asking people to hold their developer or designer hat loosely and be very open to learning things outside of that very strict box that we put ourselves into, and just thinking, Developers should be open to learning more about design and working very closely with designers and learning to think like a designer rather than becoming a designer, whatever that might mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I, would, I would agree with that. I see design as kind of um, opinions about how things should work and look and, and so forth, uh, and then a lot of process. So how do we make those decisions based on our users and as a team, based on the product? Um, and then there's like the whatever execution stage, the building things in Figma. Um, developers don't necessarily have to be on the last one, but should absolutely be part of the first two. Um, either having opinions on what, what looks good and what doesn't, um, and having those opinions be informed by their, uh, by their technical practice. Um, and then, yeah, if there are processes around design, um, that, that might be a place for, a, even though you're a developer, a front-end developer, um, absolutely, a, a place for you to participate. Mm. Do you have a mic? Yeah. Oh, oh, she doesn't okay. have a mic. Can we get another microphone? <laughs> uh, I think it's over there. Yeah, uh, and I think I, I'm totally uh, plus one to what's been said already. And I think that there's also an aspect of the surface area of building web apps, even let alone you know the infinity of other products that we could be building and developing and designing is getting so huge that there's no way that any one person can kind of hold all of the skills in themselves that are necessary to take into account when building these complex systems. So I think the other thing that we can really try to do better, and perhaps like, uh, you know, as has sort of been hinted at already, is, is to really be able to collaborate with people who are taking a totally different approach or have a totally different ex perspective on the same thing that we're all trying to build. And so being able to work together in multidisciplinary teams um, and, and really making sure that we all value those differences in each other's backgrounds, in each other's perspectives, in each other's areas of focus and skill sets, and not, um, falsely prioritize some over others and kind of think that the skills that we have are the only skills necessary to build a really great thing. Mm. 
And I, as to, to build software, I think you know, there are some natural constraints. If you're a team of one, you must do everything yourself. If you're a team of many, you can specialize a little bit. So maybe to this question of collaboration versus like synchronously being able to make these product decisions in one head, um, where, where does the like, difference you know, really become? Like what type of sort of design tasks or what kind of product tasks require that one person or that, that tight synchronous collaboration? And when can we be more sort of you know, split uh, responsibilities? among the team? Mm, well, I feel like Steve's going to be the, <laughs> <laughs> the expert on this one. Uh, I'm, I'll maybe quickly say my, my initial take on it would be when products are early, or, I mean that really early phase when you're trying to just describe the shape of something or define the shape of something, to have someone uh, who can understand like the technical requirements on a very deep level in a way that I think most designers just don't. If you haven't coded, like you don't understand all the tiny things that are going to get tripped up in databases and front-end code. Like you just can't. Um, and that's where having someone who intimately knows how to code and has been trained in design thinking or UX, it's like it just makes an incredible difference to the quality of the product and being able to conceive of what is possible and the shape of, of what is possible. Mm. Um, I think when you have a larger established product, maybe you can split up into teams, you get into specialization, and you're just maintaining or building out an existing thing. Maybe not as important, but early product definition, if you're in any kind of agency or company that does that, that's where those hybrid thinkers are critical. Mm. Yeah, I, I would say that well, most of design, like most of development, is following conventions. Um, you're not starting from scratch every time. Uh, and that's especially true if you're de uh, designing for a very opinionated platform, like iOS or something. You're kind of following the Hague. You're, uh, you're copying other apps. Um, and that, that's totally normal. I, I think the parts where you have to come up with an actual like original <laughs> design um, can be really, really tricky for designers as well as develop, like development teams where it's like, well, how should this very custom part of our, our app feel? Um, not necessarily even like look, but like how should this interaction be or you know, what should our whatever pricing calculator uh, look like, feel like? Uh, very hard to do just from like Figma and just from Mox. Uh, it, it's a place where you want to iterate with a developer uh, or have a developer own that and do the whole hybrid thing. Um, but yeah, the further you get away from like um, conventions and the, the tracks, like the more the, the kind of the hybrid design developer collaboration is, is important. If it's just a button and if it's just a button in iOS, or what, like you don't need a designer who you know, codes to, to make that. Um, you might not even need a designer. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, which would probably be a good talk name or something. Um, but yeah, uh, once, once you start getting into weird stuff, then uh, that's where it matters. So Steve, I wanted to ask your personal take on this because I feel like you embody this kind of like synchronous uh, designer developer mm -hmm. sort of like workflow, right? Like how many hours have you spent perfecting the arrows in oh, Field Row? Many and, hours. And what does that process look like? Is there pure intuition and taste or is there an element of sort of user uh, research and, and, and sort of more methodical design process? Yeah, uh, like I said earlier, like design is a lot of, of processes. Like, how do you make a decision? If that decision is a color, right? Like, um, if you've ever seen graphic designers work, they have libraries of color and source material. They are not just picking their favorite blue. It's 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 a process. It's a, a lot of iteration. Um, designing a perfect arrow is uh, the same. It's it's just that. And with all these sort of like hybrid design developer problems, being able to iterate and say like, ah, that's not exactly right, or that's, that's better, or whatever, and, and kind of work your way towards a solution in the same way that you would with a layout or with a color scheme or with like a design, like normal design system, um, that, that iterative process is just impossible to do if, if you're just doing this on, um, on something like at, uh, from Mox. Um, and it, yeah, it, it is really like, oh, well, that's, that arrow feels better than the other one, or like, oh, look what happens when they're too close together. Like that's a case that I didn't mm -hmm. didn't think of. Um, and having a having the ability to do that iteration um, is like the only way to do the design um, to make that decision about this is the perfect arrow mm -hmm. or this is the perfect ink. Um, yeah. How much do you think that's a we promise not to talk about tools. We're not talking about tools, but mm -hmm. a complete lack of like decent 
uh, developer and designer tool, like the fact that a designer cannot iterate in Figma in any meaningful interactive way. I always say like Figma is the worst design tool except for all the others. Um, it still like profoundly does not meet our needs as designers mm. and developers to build like really good products. Uh, and there's just a lack of a tool that is somewhere in between Figma and React. Yeah, I, I saw your, your tweet about that, and Sorry. I was like, <laughs> like that's bait. Like that is. Like, <laughs> um, I, I think it's very tempting to think that. Uh, not not to criticize the the, the the feeling like oh I wish my the, but it's really about having um, the, especially if you are designing within a convention or for a platform the more that that tool knows about what you're designing like the less you have to design hmm. and that's a it's a big issue with for example Figma normal kind of like mock based uh, tooling is that it's like you're just faking everything all the time um, that's almost the <laughs> it's almost a separate issue to like how would you have tooling that allows you to uh, design whatever like a interactive pricing calculator um, just as the example um, I, I, I don't know if you can have something like that like you really I think every product where this is important the the situation is normally unique enough that you you really do need mm -hmm. to do it in in the same uh, code base almost as you're, like what you're going to ship mm -hmm. And I wonder if there's maybe some lessons also to learn in how we think about as engineers kind of baking in some of the conventions of a particular code base, a particular project, like particular style rules around how the code is written, um, particular uh, conventions like, you know, with the advent of TypeScript and, and static typing around like what types of data is going to be passed around in our programs. Are there also ways that we can, as a community, really think m differently about baking in some of the questions that you know we know a designer is going to be asking us or some of the iterations some of the changes that we could imagine are possibly going possibly going to be asked for by the design team in the future is there a way to kind of um, help integrate those with our existing code based tooling to make it easier for us as developers to see those possibilities and stick to those constraints as they are developed understanding that they might change understanding that similarly to how we might uh, you know, tweak our linting rules once things become a problem, um, we might need to kind of codify more or less of the design choices into the code base in, in a way that we can easily move forward later when things yeah. change. Yeah, this is sort of the, the promise of design, design systems, systems, right? Yeah. Um, the promise. The yeah. promise. They never work. <laughs> oh, that, that, there, there was some deep hurt behind that. <laughs> uh, do you, do you want to talk? Is, is this design system in the room with us right now? Is, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, design systems are fine. Uh, they're they're good. Um, they can also sort of, as I'm sure, I'm sure some people in the room probably work for companies big enough where they have extensive design systems teams. Um, my feeling is that small prob products often move fast enough that if you do a design system too early, it, it ends up being more of a problem than it, it solves. Um, but that said, I yeah. It's, uh, if, if, if you can make the promise real, then it's quite, quite effective at that kind of uh, shared language between d developers and designers and sort of, in, like you said, in anticipating change and anticipating styles. Yeah. I wish there was as with everything, yeah. as with engineering in general, you know, premature optimization always being a problem. Yeah. yeah. Just weighing that trade off between how much time do we spend ensuring the tooling is going to encode all of our current assumptions versus how much time do we spend actually validating those assumptions and seeing if we actually need those things that we thought that we need. Yeah. I think it's just, it's, it's almost like coming back full circle to <laughs> the original problem of how do we create an iterative process that's, that can move as quickly as we need it to. Mm. Yeah, um, I think like following this sort of, I feel like the, the, the logical conclusion of this conversation is like, what is the sort of relation between UX and DX in, in a way, right? Like it is, you know, they often like, you know, post antithesis, you know, there's a lot of moralistic, you know, for example, web developers who think that building DX tools is, is putting the user second. Um, but I think Maggie, you've been kind of like historically very uh, critical of the user experience of the developer tools that we use. You know, there. You know, for example, it's completely impossible for a, a designer who doesn't have technical mentorship to even like get a modern React project running most of the time. Um, so, what do you think that you know everybody in this room should uh, do to sort of like <laughs> help help along this sort of you know collaboration? 
Um, hmm, okay, how do I answer it in a short way? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, so I, I usually take the position that, yeah, um, developer experience is like at the moment really quite bad. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on stage, so I won't, but I would use swear words. Um, I mean, as developers, like, I, I mean, I'm a bad developer, but I'm a developer too. Like, I feel bad for me and all of you for like having to use these tools right now. Uh, they are like fundamentally don't take advantage of our like very rich visual embodied understanding of the world. They're like very limited. We're all stuck in text. Like, it's all like should be better. Um, and the kind of question is all how do you raise that quality bar? And one is developers getting more interested in user experience and design as a discipline, getting better at UX and design because designers are never going to build better. Uh, developer tooling, developers solve their own problems with tools. They're infamous for it, right? Like Vim, Emacs, right? They kind of go all out, really wild, crazy systems. But they're never coming at it with a very rich understanding of interaction design and visual design uh, and, and the process of designing things for someone else and doing user testing and iterating on that. Uh, I think the way developer tooling gets built now doesn't have a lot of like very um, sophisticated or nuanced design practice to it. Uh, and if if there were a group of designers, I mean developers that w were to skill up in design and then solve their own problems with tools and apply the design thinking process, I think DX tooling would level up. So that's kind of my current like I guess hammer I'm wielding is like how do you get people who are already inclined towards design like you're you're one who well you came from design first, but people who live at the hybrid of those two are probably the ones who are going to build the best DX tools in the future. Yeah. If if I can piggyback on that, the uh, <laughs> just like most DX tools are not designed. Yeah. Like, well, yeah. and I say that in in that there's there's uh, there's not a design process involved in the creation of this API or whatever. Um, a design process that's like founded on the idea that like, well, I don't know how this should work. We should get the people in and figure it out that way. And um, <laughs> and so I, I would say like the probably the. It, it's really zero to one in most cases um, with with DX, and uh, you can tell when it's good. When it's good, and you're like, ah, no, you had you, you asked you, you involved some people not on the team in this, <laughs> the design of this API or the design of this tool or, or workflow. Um, and uh, but you can also tell when when it was just some guy. Um, yeah, and I think a lot of the most successful or most loved um, developer tooling comes from you know that one person, right? Like a person who has a taste and a vision, you know, who has like a like an original insight about you know something, and then some of them end up being successful. But then there's all those thousands of other developer tools and libraries and packages and CLIs that don't end up you know being that useful. Uh, do you think that you know applying a, a quote unquote design process you know would sort of help uh, you know those projects that are struggling? <laughs> Well, I mean, you have, if you have something out there long enough, for example, like React is a great example of uh, an API that um, has been in the wild long enough to be designed the hard way, which is to have the, the Davids of the world yelling at the team being like, this doesn't work. I'm like, please make this better. And, uh, and just so much um, interactive or interaction with, with the community. Um, new projects, small projects aren't, aren't going to have that. Um, and so, yeah, you could take your best guess at it and maybe that's fine. But I, I think uh, yeah, if, if DX is something that you want to have part of the, whatever your product's DNA from the, from the very, very beginning, then, um, then it, it shouldn't be the kind of solo, even, you, no matter what, how good your opinions are or whatever, like, uh, it's just an incomplete um, data set on which to make that decision or those decisions. And I think on that note, I think we need to follow our own advice and also ask our users, you know, <laughs> what is it that they actually need uh, instead of pretending to know that what they want. So. Mm -hmm.